Were you one of those kids who was a compulsive scribbler or a drawer or someone who made things? I was certainly someone who made things. And I think my practice now has gone full circle. What sort of things did you make? At that time, back in the dark ages, it was possible to buy little plastic dolls in Woolworths, little tiny things like this. And I used to make them into mermaids, give them plasticine tails and make them into mermaids or whatever. So I lived in a whole imaginary world, very similar to what I'm doing now. And was this when you were in primary school? Younger than that, but yeah. also in primary school. Is this one a relationship to that mask? Yes. Okay, so this demonstrates that relationship it's between that, the objects yes. and the paintings. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And were you living in Brisbane or at Tawanton? At Tawanton. So what sort of childhood was that? Oh, it was rather a lovely childhood to live in a little country town. It was, um, one could do things that children probably aren't able to do like in the big city. Like roam around. Like roam around, yes. And so is that the kind of country school where you had art classes or was that a kind of luxury that wasn't available? It definitely wasn't available. <laughs> wasn't even thought of, no. What did your family do in Tawanton? My grandmother had a, had a guest house at Noosa Heads on Hastings Street, I think it was the first guest house or something. And then she sold that and they went to Tawanton and had the Royal Mail Hotel. And my father had, a, had the first car and he then had a bus run and a picture show. My mother went to see a ballet performance <laughs> when she was young and she was a pianist, not a professional pianist, but she, and, and that's why she felt that somehow or other, some, <laughs> in some strange way that had inspired me to do what I did. Didn't, of course, but who knows. But your dad's interest in the movies, I mean, the movies were a good business, a, a good business. But so did you go to the movies a lot as a kid? I did. Mm. And you're still playing with light and shadow. Indeed. I went to high school in Toowoomba. I went to boarding school. What was the school? St Ursula's. So like a lot of kids in Queensland at the time, living in more rural areas, you, you spent five years at high school in, away as a boarder. Uh, no, only two. Mm. I wasn't very well educated. I wanted to be a ballet dancer. What sort of kind of cultural activities, for want of a better word, did you have in Toronto in the 40s? 50s? Well, none, in fact. But occasionally ballet teachers used to come, but nobody wanted to go, of course. So they'd leave. But that was enough for me to imagine that that's what I'd like to do, knowing absolutely nothing about it. It instilled some seed of longing, I suppose, that I followed up later. Oh, that's the ballet dancer that's eating a chocolate ballet. cake. Yes. Got it. So I've started making these panels to replicate a shadow, but also to bring in that connection. Did you learn ballet in Toowoomba or in Brisbane? In Brisbane. And you studied here and then did you go to the Australian Ballet School? I did. And that's in Melbourne, isn't it? Yes. So your life took you away from Brisbane at what age? I, I was about 16, 17. Goodness. It's very young. But it was the first intake of the Australian Ballet School. So we were a motley lot. Uh, after that, people were more uniform, I suppose. But in that first intake, there were people like Graham Murphy, Janet Vernon, various people with whom I've kept in touch. Mm. And yes, we were a bit of a, an odd assortment of old, young. We all had to look all right. And how long were you with the ballet company? I was with the ballet company for several years. I married um, sometime during that time. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and I left when I was pregnant with my first child. And I know that date. That's the only date I've really got a firm handle on. And what date is that? <laughs> <laughs> you left the ballet company in 1970-71 and you never went back to ballet? No. This was the first creative outlet you found. Did you leave that behind or did you bring it with you? I, I did bring it with me, but I was unaware of the fact until I had to give a talk at QUT. I was teaching there and I was thinking of what I could do that was a bit different and so I thought well I'll look at these I'll look at these aspects and so I thought well actually a sense of placement a sense of the interaction of body to body the the contact the way a body is an instrument for one's emotions creativity, tactility, all of that. And a sense of theatre. When I was in the Australian Ballet, Robert Helpman did some ballets and he was a very theatrical person and he, I think, inspired a lot of young dancers with his concept of theatre. The body is instrument, a spatial concept, probably a, a linear, well of course a linear thing, but a sense of multiplicity of components making up a whole, if you like. When you gave that talk at QUT, you were already a practicing artist yes. and you were teaching there. Yes. How did you work with the students? What did you do with them? I wandered around the studio and said as little as possible. And I used to think that was really not good, but in retrospect, I think it was probably the best thing to do, <laughs> that one can be very disruptive of a practice if one has too firm a view. So who have we got in here? <laughs> That's a friend, Luke. Matthew had a friend who was a bit of a, <laughs> a, bit of a difficult child, and um, Luke said, oh, why have you got dit, dit, dit in? <laughs> <laughs> the first eight or ten years of your practice. Right. What sort of works were they? Can you describe them? Well, they were, they were... The scale was literally to do with the body. To make... I, in fact, however this might sound, lay down on the paper and made a shape relevant, or a triangle, a rectangle, relevant to my own shape and I made a series of works using that format. So the format of my works have always been related to the body. Would some of these works be uh, God's Bones for Nicole? Yes, yes. The work in the Queensland Art Gallery collection, yes. which is as you say a number of multiple panels yes. like that. Mm. Okay so you were making um, things we might call Drawings and paintings? Pro yes, well they were paintings on paper I suppose. They were works with, I, I used charcoal and pigment and because I wasn't trained as a painter, I started, when I left the ballet company I started going to drawing classes. So because I was always, I felt that I could draw. Here in Brisbane? Yes. Who did you learn with? Mervyn Moriarty. And when I first went, there was a life class happening. And there was this very large woman sitting on the floor and this very thin, emaciated looking man holding a spear. And I thought, why on earth would anyone? <laughs> That's how little I knew. Why would anyone want to be drawing such strange looking people coming from the ballet Beauti Body Beautiful? So. I had a long way to go and I was lucky that Merv was the one who broke the ice for me, if you like. And you were married and you had the kids as when you went to drawing classes? Yes. So who's the oldest one? Matthew. Matthew. So, how, so do you remember leaving the kids at home and going out to drawing classes? I think, that I, I think that I went when I was pregnant and then I didn't go for 
Oh, right. But I tried to continue in between sure. the various pregnancies to keep it, keep it going. I think that I'd always, I'd always drawn as a child as well as doing this making and I used to draw the, my school fellows, they used to line up and I'd do these, I can't do it now but I used to be able to do it then, um, just outlines, silhouettes I suppose and I'm still doing silhouettes. Um, and then, so I thought, well, when I leave this, that's what I'll do. When I leave the ballet company, I've got something I want to do. And so that idea was always in the back of my mind. It's quite a difficult thing to leave, for a lot of people, to leave such a concentrated discipline and life and go out into the real world, but I was pretty sure of what I wanted to try to do, so I didn't have that difficulty. Do you remember what the first work was that you exhibited? Can you remember your first show? Yes, I can remember my first show. They were cats. Cats? Pictures of cats? Goodness, where was that? Abstracted cats and they were in a, at the Salander Gallery in Canberra. I was probably relatively nervous, but it's much easier to make work in a studio and then it's done, there's nothing, you can, and put it up on the wall because there's nothing more you can do. Whereas in a performance, you can really get it wrong and, and that's much more disastrous. I've seemed to be interested in contained forms and the cat, a curled up cat, fills that quite successfully. Sometimes when a form is very dominant, it, for me, in a way takes over from an engagement with the viewer. If something's, if the intervals are close, then, then there's, a bit like the shadows, there's an allowance for a mirror, mirroring, mirroring, or, <laughs> or um, some kind of reference to the viewer, some kind of doubling or... So you're thinking about the mirroring of the viewer's body to, yes. to the s sketched out amorphous body? Yes. As a, as a conduit rather than, a, than something one observes. When the eyes are... I mean, this is probably fanciful, but when the eyes aren't the dominant thing, then other senses have to come into play. So it's forcing, it's forcing another, a different kind of engagement. It's not principally about rewarding the eye. No, no, and I think that's always been the case because of that, because of that constant reference to the body and our eyes are a small part of, well, they're not a small part, but they're not the only way of communicating. I wanted to talk to you now about the work that you made in, in the first decades. And, and there's a work in the Queensland Art Gallery collection which dates from 1988 to 1991 called God's Bones for Nicole. And I know that there were a number of emotional and personal questions that you explored through the work through the work at that time. Yes. Can you talk to us a little bit about what, what you thought in retrospect was driving your work? I th well, it was because soon after Matthew, I became pregnant with a, another baby and that child died, it was cot death. But at the time, people didn't make, you know, it was just all hushed up and the baby was taken away and I didn't ever know what it, where she was buried, for instance. So the whole thing was made, uh, was never referred to. And quite a long time later, a friend of mine who'd been at the, I'd been to the ballet school with, 
came to visit and she and we were talking about it and she said you know you could find out and um, so I did find out and that made me feel because it was an unmarked grave that I needed to do something to commemorate that life that had really been very influential for want of another word so the Godsburn's work was for Nicole to make a memorial that she'd never had. And all of those re repeated forms that are in the work, they're very um, typical of the work that you were doing at that time, which mm. mirrored the body. Mm. Mm. So I suppose I've been for a very long time trying to, well, this sounds very maudlin, but trying to give her back some form of life you know, that she was denied. Can you talk to me about the big books, for example? How do the big books relate to the bodily exchanges that you were interested in? I think the big books are, well, it was a way of bringing the work down from the wall. It has a performative aspect. It requires some effort to turn the pages. They're waxed, so it brings in the sense of smell, of touch, of an engagement that's in some ways more rich than just looking. Image of absence, for example, let's talk about that because that's a really major work with shoe lasts, clock. What's happening in that work? Because it's a really major one from that time. I think that mortality is always an issue in the work, be it on a specific level or a more general level. I think what I try to do is to talk about what it is to be human and the fragility of that experience. So image of as absence clearly is referring to loss, to the fleeting time, our fleeting... The fleeting time, time that life that, is. Yes, that we inhabit the, the world. The, so the clock, of course, and the racks of shoe lasts. Where on earth did you get all those shoe lasts? When we first came, when we first came back to Brisbane, my former husband, who was a ballet dancer, uh, when, when he first joined the company, some Russian dancers were guest artists and he did something for them and they gave him a shoe, a ballet shoe that was different from what was available in Australia and he started making them for himself and then started making them for whoever else was wanted one. And that when he left, when he stopped dancing, he started a, making a shoe factory and he bought this old boot factory from somebody or other and there were all those shoe lasts which he had no use for so I took them and I've been using them ever since. <laughs> and so tell us what happened when you went to Calcutta and what happened with your work then? Well I was, I was a little nervous but when I got there I realised that the ballet company had travelled to very similar places and that it wasn't that unfamiliar. I decided that I should do something about working with video, but I didn't know how to and I'm pretty incompetent in lots of ways. So I had a friend video something for me and I found it so exciting. I thought this is just so great. I like this. That was the beginning of the Veil series of works. And what I did was I wrapped the camera in in that case a sari, and walk the streets of Calcutta because it wasn't possible to walk around holding a camp well, it would be tricky. So your work with video and your work with painting continued in the years that followed and that led through to a number of major works, Projections for Eliza is one I can think of, but also Sonorous Bodies which was this marvellous 
collaborative work, installed musical piece that you did with Elysian New Music Ensemble and particularly with the composer Lisa Lim. Can you talk to us about how your video and your other art practices came towards such a, a different manifestation as Sonorous Bodies? What happened there? It was, it was a collaboration in one sense, but in a way what I did was illustrate the concept. And so it wasn't a direct response to the music. It was a response to the idea. Um, and so there were, there were elements that I had to describe, like shadow or earth, breath. And so, and so I did videos, minimal videos relating to each of these elements. And they were shown simultaneously with the musician. So in these cases, there's a dialogue between the videos and the, and the painting works. Can you talk mm. to us just a little bit about that dialogue between the video and the painting? The videos, the videos became the inspiration for the paintings. That just evolved. And so the paintings were abstractions of images from the videos. And the idea of that was, again, to allow another something else to happen. The abstraction was a way of opening up the dialogue with the viewer. These are all ready to go off to the show? Yes. But this one's going. No, that one's not going. That one's not this going. one is. This one's going. You did this, huh? Yep. Okay. I have to. Yep. Okay, I got it. And you just find them wherever you can find them? Yes. This is a, um, oh God, a mason's garment. Ah, then something changed, didn't it? Your video practice had been really quite well established. You'd been working with video for seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. But in 2003, you made a very important video called One Dances, which started, as it happened, a new cycle. Can you talk to us about One Dances? I was... Um wandering around Sydney, looking at the antique shops as I do. And I saw in the window this fantastic mannequin and it was quite expensive. And I thought, oh, well, too bad, I can't get that. But then I went to my dealer and she gave me some money that I, and I rushed back and bought this mannequin. And that became almost like the Reincarnate. Oh, this, oh, this sounds really whatever. The reincarnation of Nicole. So I used her. I've used her right the way through, pretty much. And that first video was with my youngest son, Luke, dancing with the mannequin. And that led to a suit the other series. So that was, it's a very beautiful work, much loved and much collected, where he, he dances intently, uh, as only a trained actor can, around the stage. And who's behind the camera, Judith? My middle son, Peter, who's, he videos, he, unless I can't, un unless I don't have any other option, he videos for me now rather than me. So most of the videos in that series, Peter has shot. What happened next? Because you still had the wonderful mannequin that you, you wanted to work with. How did the rest of them unfold? Because we now have a total of seven videos under the collective title, Seven Stages of Desire. Where did it go from there? Well, after that one, I thought, well, I'd like to continue this progression of this fictitious, the life of this child. 
So I was, I thought that I'd use, because it seemed appropriate, my colleagues and friends, Janet and Graham Murphy. And so the next one was, I used them. And again, Peter filmed it and it was called Between and it was a, the mannequin was the disruptive force in that, in that pairing. So that was the next one. And then we were, we were talking about it over coffee and um, I said, I think I'd like to do one with an older woman now. And Graham said, why don't you ask Maggie? And I said, oh, look, I don't know whether Maggie was too keen on me. And he said, well, I'll ask her. We were talking about Dame Margaret Scott here. Yes. The formidable head of the Australian Ballet yes. School. So, and, and Graham was, a, she, she was very fond of Graham. So he asked her and she was delighted to do it. And I have to say that since then, our relationship has been wonderful. She's an extraordinary woman. I see that you have a storage issue. Yeah. I kind of, this is the, the, they're just the, the store. The store. I want to find, yeah, I want to find one, like which one would be best? Do you know what I'm trying to do? Yeah. They're Great. just ones that have never been so made. They're then hanging around waiting to yeah. be cast. Yep, so this, this all relates, and of course, to, to shadow. I suppose I've always been really interested in primitive art. It, that's been more inspirational for me than anything else. So because of its simplicity, because of its other function in lots of cases, I suppose. Including its magical functions. Exactly, yeah. And its ritualistic functions. And, and so I've always been drawn to those. And when I was trying to make this transition from one world to the next, for want of a better way of saying it, um, the mask was something that came up automatically. And so I've used masks that I've collected until I've run out <laughs> and have to replenish them. But that's been an ongoing interest that's now become a part of the work. Some of these you had for years, didn't you? Yes. And tell us the countries that they came from just as a sort of... Oh, Japan... India, South America, Korea. Was there one from Sicily? Yes. So from, from all over the world. From all over the world. And they've featured in your work ever since, well, for the last seven or eight years. Yes. I do remember one day when you said, I've got this new work in the studio, I want you to come and have a look at it. I think you'll think I'm mad, was more or less what you said. <laughs> So that was Awake. Can you yes. talk to us about Awake, the work you finished in 2011? Talk to us about Awake All right. and the masks and the figures, the mannequins. One of the... Um, also in my collecting life, I'd collected a lot of musical instruments, old ones that no longer were functioning. And I, and I was interested in the memory that those instruments held, not what they used to be, not what they currently are. So I had all these things and I thought, oh, I, oh to roll back, I'd started making little sculptures because I had that fellowship and I was looking at the work of Pliny the Elder and and um, Plato and things and and so I thought these little sculptures I didn't think I could make sculpture for a start but when I the little bronze ones the little bronze ones so then I I thought oh well I'll make life-size ones and I'd already made this work with the mannequins so and I'd bought the odd dressmakers dummy and things so I thought, well, the logical thing to do is put the mask on the dummy and give it a musical instrument. And so that was the beginning of Awake. And, and conceptually it worked because I thought this can be Awake, the, 
the celebration of a life and that's how it happened. There are, I think there are no fewer than 16 figures, so it's a very large constellation of figures all gathered together. The dummies, the masks, the musical instruments. Talk to us more about the shadows. The, the shadows are really more important than the actual objects. In these last three installations, shadow for me allows all of those concepts to be rolled into one in a way. It's, it's a mirroring, it's a, it can be seen as the soul, it's in some ways viewed as the soul, it's a distillation of, it's an abstraction. So it encompasses more than in some sense as the videos were a way of making the works on paper, then these creatures are a way of making the shadows. So it's the, it's the spin-off, if you like, but in that it encompasses more than the sum of its parts. It strikes me that, which I haven't thought about before, that the shadows are also real time for we viewers. Yes. But they're actually there, there, and not to be, and not static or fixed. Because we, you, you, you have very precise lighting, which is actually very much like stage lighting, very yes, dramatic. It is. Yes. Yeah. I remember that you said that the classical idea from Roman and Greek thought was that the shadow was like the soul of the person yes. on the ground. So this, this, this goes to mortality. Can you talk to us about the second work called The Journey? Because we need to get a stronger idea of the, the three parts and what the narrative was that unfolded across these three enormous sculptural installations. Well, the next one is a journey, and that was a journey through the afterlife, sort of. I mean, it, it was installed in a, in a sense. I mean, it can be anything. I don't want to. It can be refugees. It could be whatever one chooses to make it. But in my view, it's a journey through the underworld to the next life. And so it was installed. The walls were painted and it was installed in a space where the procession snaked through this cavernous space and they were pushing wheelbarrows or prams or rowing whatever. a little boat was rowing it? a little boat hmm. So they were all in little in little vehicles or yes, conveyances. Yes, they were all in something that was mo that was allowing mobility. And this work was shown at the Biennale of Sydney. Yes, uh, in two thousand and twelve. Yes. Okay, so that's and what's the third one? The third one is destination, and that's the arrival of whatever one would perceive that to be. It can be a joyous place or a not so joyous place or a whatever. It's because open to interpretation. Well, that work does have very complex indications. I mean, there are some things in it that are scary and foreboding and others that are just madly joyous. Can you yes. talk to us about several of those elements? Well, there's, for instance, there's a, um, a ballet dancer eating a chocolate cake. So there is, there's this myth that ballet dancers don't eat chocolate cake. Well, in fact, they do. But so it's, it's thinking about what one would like. You know, I asked several people, when you die, what would you like to happen? And though I haven't really been able to follow that in any direct way, that's the premise. So the, so the, the merry-go-round, is it, that, that lovely antique merry-go-round, I yes. suppose that's a kind of a symbol for 
playing forever. Yes, mm. yes. Yeah. Judith, it, it always has to come up to date. What are you working on now? I'm still working on Destination. The work is not finished? No. How many pieces have you made so far? Like how far along are you with it? Well, I don't know. I've, well, I've made 12 maybe or something, but I'm not sure when I'll finish. So you haven't quite reached your destination? No, I'm still looking for it. <laughs>